Welcome. All right, welcome everyone today's, uh, to today's research translation seminar. I have uh, here today uh, Marie Smith AC, uh, Emeritus Professor and Director of the Center for Integrated Preclinical Drug Development in the School of Biomedical Sciences at UQ. Internationally, she is a leading researcher in biomedical discovery and translation with particular expertise in the novel pain therapeutics field. She is inventor on patented novel analgesic technology that was licensed to the UQ Spinac company, Spinifex Pharmaceuticals, for commercialization and acquired by Novartis in 2015. Although her focus is on IP sensitive research, she has maintained an excellent publication output with over 175 publications to date. She has also advised or co-advised 32 PhD students and 50 research master's honors students to completion, as well as mentored numerous researchers in the past three decades. Today, she's going to talk to us about developing drugs from targets or small molecules and funding opportunities. Welcome. Thank you, James. The... Okay, so as you've probably heard from many other people, uh, partnering is the key for progressing from uh, drug discovery through translation. And so novel therapeutics development is a long and risky business. Very expensive. Why do people do it? Well, there's a the large unmet medical needs, but there's also the opportunity for a huge financial return um, because it is so risky. If you, along this, the, I'm showing you the journey there from very early discovery up until um, the product gets on the market. So um, there are technology readiness levels, TRLs. So many of you will be working in the TRL1, TRL2 area, so in biomedical discovery. And today I'm going to talk about focus primarily on TRL levels three, four, and five as they apply to small molecules discovery. The valley of death, we, we hear about the valley of death, but it actually exists pretty much between every one of those levels. And the valley of death that you think about in your own mind is very much related to where you are in that journey. So, um, yes, three, 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 to, three, to, three to five is what I'm gonna talk about. Three to six, okay, the long and winding road. So for, for small molecules, uh, we need multidisciplinary uh, research to be able to get from the target to a molecule that has the right um, pharmacokinetics as well as efficacy for it ever to become a drug. So medicinal chemistry is very, very important for small molecule drug discovery. So the chemical structure affects the interaction with the target, whether it be a receptor ion channel or an enzyme, and it also affects the pharmacokinetics. So that is what the body does to the drug. So what the drug does to the body is the pharmacodynamics, and what the, the body does to the drug is the pharmacokinetics. So the relationship between pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics will dictate whether there's a therapeutic index, whether there is a suitable um, dose range where you can get efficacy without toxicity. So those relationships are very, very important. And it would be very unusual for just one researcher to be expert in all of those disciplines. So uh, my center is the one in the red box there the Centre for Integrated Preclinical Drug Development. And uh, my centre and four others, we have partnered with Therapeutic Innovation Australia 
to create this small molecule platform of Therapeutic Innovation Australia. And so collectively, we have the capabilities to add value to biomedical researchers' uh, work to help them translate it uh, towards uh, being ready for development. So this is where the biomedical researchers are. And so, and in Australia, biomedical research in general is drug target rich, but molecule poor. So where can you get molecules from? Well, in Australia, Compounds Australia, I can, yeah, there they are. Compounds Australia has about 100,000 compounds and about 100,000 uh, extracts from nature that any researcher can access. So they have a state-of-the-art storage facility, which has been funded by Therapeutic Innovation Australia on the Griffith, um, Nathan campus of Griffith University. And so they've been going for about uh, a dozen years or so. So you can request um, compounds of a particular type uh, from Compounds Australia. So they're open access from Compounds Australia and they will give them to you in some sort of um, multi-plate format. And then you can have a screen done if you don't have the screening capabilities within TRI, which I don't think you do, um, then you can apply uh, to uh, the various screening facilities in Australia, contact Therapeutic Innovation Australia and they can give you an introduction so there's a network of screening facilities in Australia. So you can get the compounds, you can get them screened. And then from that screen, you're gonna get some hits, hopefully. Now hits don't have optimized druggability uh, properties and they're often quite low um, binding, binding uh, constants. So what can happen is those hits can be triaged by people with a lot of expertise in the Australian Translational um, Medicinal Chemistry Facility, which is based in Melbourne. So at low cost, for less than $2,000, you, you can get some intellectual input into the assessment of those hits if you don't have that expertise yourself. And uh, they also um, work with uh, discovery researchers to improve those hits to turn them into leads. So to have drug-like properties in terms of the pharmacokinetics, so no uh, drug metabolism liabilities and having a suitable um, half-life in, uh, in, in a rodent pharmacokinetic study, this can be done at the Centre for Drug Candidate Optimization, again in Melbourne, and they are in close proximity to the uh, Translational Medicinal Chemistry Facility. So these guys work very closely together. So once there's a lead compound, it can be assessed in um, efficacy models, which the, the disco discovery researchers may already have those. They may have collaborator collaborators in place for those. And in the pain space, they can come to us. And what TIA is in the process is in the early stages of doing is creating a network of efficacy facilities with you know, validated models in a range of therapeutic areas that can be accessed. So that's like a project for the next couple of years. And then for exploratory toxicology or GLP tox in rodents, that can be done at TetraQ. So you can get from your uh, drug target, some hits, the hits triaged and optimised through medicinal chemistry to, in conjunction with um, drug metabolism, pharmacokinetic expertise through efficacy assessment, exploratory toxicology, and then potentially have a molecule that will attract some commercial interest. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about uh, my centre. Um, we're in the School of Biomedical Sciences on the St. Lucia campus of um, University of Queensland. 
I've described the, I briefly get, get given you a description of the other four translational research centres that we've partnered with. We've all partnered with Therapeutic Innovation Australia and the goal is to make our discovery and develop, well, mainly development capabilities accessible to uh, academic and SME researchers at a subsidised rate. And we can do that because TIA has given us some money to employ some key people to operate the high-end infrastructure. And all of these facilities are operated uh, under quality systems, so there are SOPs for everything. So at the CIPDD, our expertise is uh, highly specialised in the pain therapeutics field. I have 15 um, rodent pain models that mimic individual human pain conditions. The studies are undertaken uh, under a quality system in a NATA GLP accredited facility, which makes that um, unique uh, in, in Australia and rare internationally. And the, the aim is to improve preclinical to clinical translation. And uh, we can also um, bring up other efficacy models on request. So some others that we have is uh, multiple sclerosis and diabetes and uh, soon to be Parkinson's disease. Apart from efficacy, um, oftentimes we need to look at adverse effect liabilities. So some of the ones that uh, we do fairly routinely is uh, respiratory depression, constipation, general health and clinical signs, and some ex vivo tissue collections for um, immuno and uh, molecular biological assessments. We also do various plate-based assays for efficacy. Very uh, experienced staff who can do some very tricky dosing routes, including intracerebroventricular administration. So that's injecting directly into the CSF of, of the rodent brain. Intrathecal is at, at the spinal level and uh, infusions or bolus injections. So it, unless you're in the pain field or you're suffering, you or your loved ones suffer from pain, most people don't realise that pain has a lot of subtypes. And so you need a model for each one of those subtypes. And so neuropathic or nerve pain uh, can be induced by chemotherapy, by antiretroviral drugs that are used to treat, um, uh, prevent HIV, uh, sciatica, a relapsing remitting uh, EAE mouse model of multiple sclerosis induced central neuropathic pain, uh, two different diabetic models. So this one is a model of type 1 diabetes. This one is a model of type 2 diabetes. And then a what people use is capsaicin, which is the hot component of the chilli pepper. You can inject that into a hind paw of a mouse or a rat and sensitise the nociceptors. So that's the pain-detecting nerve endings. And that can be a relatively high-throughput model before you do these more uh, in-depth models. Uh, chronic inflammatory pain, we have a model of osteoarthritis and uh, adjuvant, Freud's complete adjuvant induced hind poor inflammation. Nociceptive pain or pain um, that is not neuropathic and not inflammatory, chronic, low, chronic mechanical low back pain, post-surgical pain, and various other forms of acute pain. So I'm going to give you a brief case study. So I was approached by Professor Matt Cooper, who at that time was a professor in the IMB, Institute for Molecular Biosciences um, on the St. Lucia campus. And he had this interesting molecule, MCC950, and he wanted to know whether it was um, had analgesic activity for relief of central nerve pain. So this is um, pain that has its um, origins in the central nervous system, in particular associated with multiple sclerosis. MCC950 uh, was an orally active NLRP3 inflammasome inhibitor. 
So a couple of years before that, we'd actually developed a relapsing remitting mouse model of um, multiple sclerosis. And the reason we did this was because the model used by most other people was not relapsing remitting. It was primary progressive. But 85% of patients have relapsing remitting. And so with a, it took about 18 months, but we ended up developing this relapsing remitting model. And what we wanted to know was, um, did they have pain? And so uh, the, what we showed was that, and so with pain behavioural testing, you need to be blinded. So you don't know which animals um, are the disease and which, which aren't. And so we could see we had hind poor hypersensitivity developing and it was fully developed by about four weeks of the model. And uh, we followed these out for seven weeks. And those that did not get the um, induction protocol, they just had um, the uh, adjuvant, uh, the two adjuvants, they did not develop hind poor hypersensitivity. And it was important to show that there was demyelination and uh, activation of astrocytes and mi microglia. So you can see that here. And then we were interested in looking in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord because that's where all the, um, nose, the primary afferent nerve fibres that are uh, in the somatosensory nervous system signalling for pain, that's where the, the first synapse is in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And again, we saw activation of both astrocytes and microglia. So uh, in, in terms of immuno, the model was doing what we uh, wanted it to do and behaviorally it was doing what we wanted it to do. So uh, I, we tested the MCC950 we waited till the model was fully developed. Then we started um, in the gray. In the gray is the three-week dosing with the active drug, the MCC950, and you can see that we reversed the hind paw hypersensitivity, and there was attenuation of the clinical signs of the uh, MS model. And so this data was then able to be used by uh, Matt as further exemplification of their, um, of their IP. So uh, in summary, at the CIPDD, we have successfully partnered with Therapeutic Innovation Australia and several other translational research centres to create the Small Molecules Platform of TIA. The platform's uh, capabilities are accessible to you at discounted rates because TIA funds some of our staff. And furthermore, um, there are TIA pipeline accelerator vouchers that Stuart would have told you about if he was here, but he's not able to be here, so I'm going to tell you about them. So they're available to researchers on a competitive basis uh, twice a year and that further reduces the cost of accessing the capabilities. So I've just uh, spent you know, the last 10 minutes or so telling you about the small molecule platform of TIA, but there's also the National Biologics Facility. The vouchers can be used to access the National Biologics Facility's capabilities, as well as the cell and gene therapies capabilities. So the, all up across the three capabilities, there are 24 uh, translational research uh, facilities supporting therapeutic development. They've been grouped together into the, these mature and high potential um, groupings and uh, access for researchers and SMEs is um, on a case by case basis. So, Say you wanted to um, have some, something done at the biologics uh, facility or at the uh, translational medicinal chemistry uh, facility, you would approach either TIA or the facility directly, discuss with them what you want and you'd go back and forth a few times and then they would give you a quotation for what it was going to cost 
and then you would put in an application with their help to TIA and uh, then there's a, uh, a panel that TIA, ha TIA have of very experienced people who will decide who's going to get, who's going to get the subsidy and, and who isn't. So the vouchers are for up to 50K, so you need matching funds. They're in increments of 5,000, so you can ask for as little as 5,000, as much as 50. So that means the total uh, project cost is 100 up to. Open to all SMEs and um, academics. Twice a year, these are on offer. So the round closed on the 30th of April. The next round is in September. Uh, the TIA takes no IP stake uh, or um, doesn't ask for anything in return. The aim is to promote and enable researchers to access capabilities and TIA also use it as a mechanism to road test potential new facilities. So this has been going for 20, uh, since 2018 for three years and 66 projects have been funded. 14 of them were SMEs. All up 2.6 million has been given out. Killer experiments were done. Now, not, not every killer experiment is successful. That's why they're called killer experiments, to kill off um, IP, uh, to kill off ex um, discoveries that are not, not gonna go anywhere, kill them off early and production to support clinical trials uh, as well. So a QGen example, in 2018, they expanded a bank of T cells to treat viral complications in transplant patients and a, a clinical trial started in 2020. At the um, Australian Translational Medicinal Chemistry Facility in Melbourne, a researcher, um, was given medicinal chemistry uh, voucher to develop novel asthma drugs, which led to a startup company in 2019. And two examples where the researchers accessed the National Biologics Facilities. One is the South Australian SME to produce a novel COVID-19 vaccine for mutant strains. That was in May 2021, and they've now just got addition, and, and in May 20. May 2021, they've got additional 3 million from the MRFF. And another one um, assisted the University of the Sunshine Coast researchers in producing a chlamydia vaccine for koalas. And their clinical, their clinical trial in the koalas uh, started last month. So I'd just like to acknowledge um, Therapeutic Innovation Australia uh, who uh, we're, we've partnered with to make the um, small molecule platform to help researchers move their small molecules down to an investable proposition. Thank NCRIS because NCRIS provides the money for Therapeutic Innovation Australia support of the various facilities. And I'd like to thank my team and the collaborating centres that we work with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have to talk into the microphone here. That's all the right. disc so it gets recorded all that. Um, I have two questions. They're both TIA related. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so how do they decide who gets their vouchers? Okay. So in the um, application, it's not just like writing an NHMRC grant application. You've actually got to say, explain how the voucher is going to add value and move, move along to the next step or, ki or kill it off, you know, ki kill off your project. So you've got to be able to articulate the value add and it's not just an extra bit of money to get your next paper. Yeah. I mean, it's important to publish at some point, of course, but it's, it's about moving the technology to the next step might be just a small step, but is moving it to the next step. So for example, if you've got a target, but no molecules, you could ask for money to um, have the molecules from Compounds Australia plated out and then screened at one of the screening facilities. That would fit very, very well. 
that's then going to give you hits. But then you need to, uh, for less than $2,000, you can get intellectual input from the Australian Translational Medicinal Chemistry Facility to help you triage those hits to then know what the next step is to get some med chem going on the most promising hits to improve them as uh, potentially druggable molecules. So, you know, and you can go back to get more money um, on the next round if you can show how you're progressing. Does and that make the, sense? Yeah, the yeah. facilities and the centres themselves will help you to apply. That's for right. Centers. We help you to apply um, for the money. But does the TIA, uh, do they provide any kind of mentorship for people who haven't gone through the process before? Yeah, I think so. Um, they would probably ask you which part of the pipeline you want to access and put you on to the people in the centres who've got the most experience in mentoring people along the journey. But also at UQ, you could probably get mentorship from uh, Uniquest people. Uh, so uh, Uniquest are very familiar with this um, setup. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. Yep. Um, thanks, Ray. That was really um, fascinating. And I hadn't really thought about this for a while. Um, so it was great to see it again. And um, it just goes to show that, that, that you know, an incredible amount of common sense has led to this, you know, a really great pipeline. Yeah. Um, with the, you mentioned the National Biologics Facility as yeah. well. Have yeah. they also developed a similar pipeline? And is there collaboration with medicinal um, chemistry around modification of the biologics to improve sort of um, either the pharmacokinetics and also targeting of those molecules? The National Biologics Facility themselves uh, have people who can help you optimise your biologics. So medicinal chemistry is more for small molecules. Yep. So, but I know the people in, you know, in the National Biologics Facility, such as Trent Munro yep. and, and his team, they have the capability to help you get rid of liabilities on your biologics and improve improve them. Yep. yep. Is the government looking at this, the success that you've had with this model already and considering this is a rolling yes. out of a lot of different versions? Yes, so that's why I mentioned that. Um, so I said there is a screening network. So there are multiple screening centres around Australia. And so an expansion of the efficacy away from just, you know, what we do at CIPTD to add on other ones uh, is, is how it's being expanded. And so TIA got a bit more money this year. And so that's going to go towards that. And the discussion is underway, the underway now. That's why Stuart had, had to go to Melbourne today, couldn't be here, is um, the next roadmap is um, under discussion now. And there was an, um, a web-based web um, process where you could say what you'd like to see added in and uh, across all of the um, NCRIS-funded facilities across Australia. And the TIA was very, very proactive in putting lots of ideas forward of how to expand it, but it's great to have all those good case studies to be able to use to show the government that it's a good investment. Yeah. yeah. Um, Marie, thank you, a great talk. Just thinking from the other side, uh, table from yeah. the pharma. Yeah. Um, so I worked for a few years in, a, in a, uh, the biologic space within Australia Biotech. And when we looked for um, contracting out some of our um, tests in the cancer inflammatory space. Yeah. We were very reluctant, very reluctant to go to academia. Yeah. That come from academia because most of the time the experience was they lack the rigor, the discipline to basically produce in the end some goods, particularly IND enabling sure. uh, results. So I'm just wondering. Um, I mean, I can, you guys have your act together. <laughs> we have our act together, otherwise we wouldn't have the TIA yeah, yeah. money. Yeah. yeah. But is, is there an opportunity to educate, uh, for example, to people that, you know, if you deal yeah. with R&D, um, yeah. I mean, IP is one issue, but, you know, 
we just can't ask for a research assistant, you know, which might then take another one year where farmer will still have the results in yeah. three, four months. Sure. That's where the TIA funding comes in to have those good people who are very experienced on time within budget working to SOPs um, and, and have the training in quality systems. So that's what the TIA money is doing. It's keeping those people in situ rather than, you know, somehow you've got to fund them between this job and the next one sort mm -hmm. of thing. So that was, so it, that's called a soft infrastructure, people, people support. And one of the hurdles to get across is to have a quality system. So last year, I was interviewed by M MTP Connect about what I thought was the number one uh, skill missing in the ecosystem, in the biomedical ecosystem in Australia. And I said, knowledge on quality systems. And so they funded Sia Pharma now to provide a free course available online in quality systems. And then you can pay a subsidised price to go to an intensive um, two-day uh, workshop. So it's, it's all, you know, multiple strategies to try and raise that baseline so that people understand that if, you're, if you've got a pipetta that's 10 microliters and I've got one and yours is giving eight microliters and mine's giving 12, well, we've got a 50% difference in our assay every time we pipette. And if there's five pipetting steps, well, there's no wonder we can't reproduce each, other, each other's work. So getting that level of knowledge out there, uh, that's a very simple example, but um, it's very important for translation. So everybody in this pipeline that I've mentioned, the five centres, we all have quality systems. And that will be a barrier to people joining the efficacy network is to get a quality system. But we're going to, but there are quality documents, um, ge generic quality documents that people can get for free off TIA called QDOCs as a starting point. And my team and I, we're happy to help anybody uh, who wants mentoring in that regard. If we just stop sharing the screen, we can see if anyone's given any questions in online. Does anyone on the Q&A? No. no, okay. Yeah. I have another sort of follow up question. To yeah. that. What your point you made there was a lack of good investment in soft infrastructure, which is us as academics being able to keep our research done. Yeah. So much time training. Training, yeah. Or having funds to do things like make sure we can service our pets on a regular basis, which is not cheap to do. It, it's, just, it's not just that we can't do the quality research, we're not funded to do that. And that's massive problem with the system. So, um, you know, is that conversation going to that next level? Because that's, I think, where the major barrier to translation is from, you know, federal investment through things like an HMRC, MRFF and ARC is the fact that it's underfunded and you know, there's so much data that shows that that's getting up to 40% levels now of underfunding. Yeah. Well, TIA, TIA, TIA recognised the problem. Yep. Um, you know, they couldn't risk all the people, you know, moving on because there was no money. Yeah. So the key people are funded by TIA. Yeah. That'd be a right one. <laughs> yeah. So with, you know, just the simple example of pipetting um, and keeping, you, you can um, do your own. Yeah, you can do your you own. Can do your own. Yeah. You still would be able to pay to get the service. Any other questions? <laughs> Sorry, I think I must have missed it, but so TIA is an NCRIS? So NCRIS, NCRIS. It's a not-for-profit company uh, funded by NCRIS to work in the uh, spaces that I showed you. So the uh, cell and gene therapy, national biologics and small molecules. So they look after all those 24 facilities that fit in those, those three towers. Or, or the, the pipeline. Yep. 
and it presses on like it's a, it's a five year cycle or something like that. Yeah, I think the last one might have been seven. Um, okay. Yeah. So this 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 cycle's got another two years to run, but the roadmap process for the next increase has started already, because it has to get into the budget. Um, you know that the the government is going to fund the next cycle of increase, so they go go through the whole process all over again. Yeah. And so that was why it's so important. I think that TIA had the voucher system to be able to capture real life examples of how the value has been added to helping researchers such as you guys to progress, even if it's just one step um, to value add. Yep. All right, well, um, please join me in thanking Marie for an excellent seminar.